Greetings everybody. In this video, let's start looking at source-free vector fields. So remember that the flux through a closed curve measures the amount of a vector field that's kind of entering and leaving that curve. So the flux we were looking at, the dot product of the vector field with the normal to the curve, and we were adding up all of those with a line integral. So as the name kind of suggests, if we have a source or a sink, it would kind of imply that more of the vector, more of the field is kind of entering than leaving the curve, or more is actually leaving than is entering the curve. If we imagine a um, point charge for an electric field, it's producing this electric field, it's going out radially in all directions, and so we have get this vector field that's heading out, we get more leaving if we look at um, a curve at the flux over that than we do um, entering. And so for this one, um, kind of our maybe quintessential example of having a source. And so what would source free mean? It means that we are free of sources. And so if we actually would do the flux over that, that um, if we are free of sources, then the amount entering the curve is the same as the amount leaving the curve. And so if we do a line integral, um, a flux integral over a simple closed curve of f dot n ds, that should give us zero. So our flux should be zero in that case for any simple closed curve. This is kind of similar to or parallel to what we were looking at for conservative vector fields when we said that the line integral over any simple closed curve um, for that one was going to be zero when we were path independent. So source free, the flux is going to be zero. And so what happens with this, we enter this new function that we can apply to our vector fields and that's called taking the divergence of this vector field. And so if we've got a vector field with component functions f1, f2, f3 in the i, j, and k directions respectively, calculating the divergence, and sometimes you see it as div um, applied to this vector field, sometimes kind of giving you a mnemonic for how you would calculate it, del dot f for that thing, our del operator, just kind of our partial, um, our gradient operator, partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z for our components, dotted with f1, f2, f3, gives us a final result of, we take the first component of our vector field, calculate the partial with respect to x, the second component of our vector field, calculate the partial with respect to y. The third component of our vector field, calculate the partial with respect to z, and add them all together. Hence the kind of um, notation of its del dot f. It looks like we are multiplying those, but we're not really multiplying. We're applying these differential operators to our component functions at that point. Okay. But we have the divergence theorem, and what the divergence theorem is really telling us is that um, similar to um, Green's theorem that we had previously seen, that if we do the double integral over a region of the divergence of a vector field, um, if we do the area integral over that, and that's the same thing as if we calculated the circulation of f dot n ds where d is just going to be some region in the plane and the partial of this partial d is again kind of reviewing that notation. This is really just the boundary of d that we were talking about similar to um, what we did with Green's theorem. And so just is in that case, if we have a simply connected region, and remember what the simply connected region gave us, it gave us no holes. And so the only boundary that we actually had was the outside boundary. We didn't have kind of this hidden boundary of going around the holes that were also in there. And so simply connected region, no holes. If the divergence was going to be zero, then that actually gave us that our flux integral was going to be zero. And so that's going to tell us that our field is going to be source free. So kind of as an analog to the conservative vector fields, um, 
for conservative vector fields, we wanted to, if it was conservative, find a potential function f. So we're finding a scalar function so that our vector field was going to be the gradient of that scalar field. So Clairaut's theorem then said that if we took the curl of that thing that take, calculated the curl in this way. So here's a little bit of a new notation with the operators that we'll see. Instead of writing that as a fraction, we'll just do a partial derivative operator with a subscript x. So this standing for partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z. Um, for something that's already partial derivatives, then what happened <clears throat> We had partial y, partial z of f, minus partial z, partial y of f, where we were getting mixed um, partial derivatives. And for the mixed partial derivatives, Collier, um, um, theorem said that those were going to be equal, so our curl was going to be 0. Well, if we do something similar now for our source-free vector fields, um, if we look at the divergence, so del dot, something that is a cross product, what happens? So we compute our cross product for this arbitrary vector field. So we get this expression. Now if we dot it um, with our gradient operator, what happens is that we get the partial of x with respect to our first component, partial of y with respect to our second component, partial of z with respect to our third component. When we distribute those partial derivative operators all across, then we've got partial x, partial y for g3, partial y, partial x, g3. If we kind of group all of those together, then we're getting the same kind of thing happen. So Clairaut's theorem is going to tell us again that when our mixed partials are equal, these guys are all going to be zero. And so we get something kind of similar to what we had with our conservative vector fields. So if our divergence of our vector field was zero, then we can find something called a vector potential. So now not a scalar potential, a vector potential so that our original vector field F looked like the curl of something else. It looked like the curl of another vector field. And that new vector field is the vector potential. And so this just, it does give us this parallel version for what we see with um, conservative vector fields. So in two dimensions, what happens there? Well, um, our vector potential kind of has this nice, super simple form to it in that our vector potential just looks like some scalar function g of x, y in the z direction. And so the scalar function, when we say scalar function, all we're meaning is we get a real number out of it, um, as opposed to a vector function where we get a vector out of it. Scalar function, we just get a real number out of it. And so that if we compute del cross a for this particular, in this particular case, where we've just got a scalar function times in a z in the z direction, then we get partial y um, of the scalar function for the first component minus partial x of the scalar function for the second component. And this function g in this case is what we call the stream function for this vector field. And so this kind of takes us through a lot of the background when we're talking about um, source-free vector fields. So this gives you an idea of maybe how this fits in in comparison to talking about some of our conservative vector fields. We get a very paralyzed, parallelized um, notions with this. And so in the next video, we'll come back and do some calculations. And I will see you guys for that one.